Hi, I'm Stu Mashwitz. I'm a filmmaker and the chief creative officer at Red Giant. My background is in visual effects, but I actually have a degree in animation. Yet I've never made an animated film until now. I didn't set out to make a short film called Tank. It just kind of happened. In this video, I'll try to explain how. But I have to warn you, this is not how I would recommend anyone make a film. I went about making Tank in the most roundabout, crazy way you could imagine. And ultimately, this painful process became a part of the point of making it. Actually, I did once set out to make this short, in high school. I wrote a script and drew endless sketches of how I imagined I'd pull off the visual effects in my backyard with zero budget on Super 8 film. Needless to say, this project never went anywhere, but the idea stuck. And one of the maquettes I built as a teenager actually survived into my adult life. Now all that's left of it is this photo from 2009. In my 20s, my career took me to Industrial Light and Magic, where I got to work on actual Star Wars movies. I got to animate the Millennium Falcon, and R2-D2, and even Han Solo. I even got to appear in a Star Wars movie or two. Maybe whatever urge I had had to make a Star Wars-inspired film was satisfied by all this fun stuff. No matter how busy I would get with Star Wars, or helping run my own visual effects company, or directing TV commercials, I still maintained that same spirit of tinkering that I had as a kid, although it was usually in front of a computer. And specifically, it's often in front of Adobe After Effects. I'm always creating little test projects, rigging things up with expressions, trying to see what I can pull off. Sometimes these test projects get used in real productions, like this commercial I directed in 2006 for Ruby Tuesday. To pitch my take on the job, I created an animatic in After Effects. I rigged up this Mini Cooper using nulls and expressions, so I could animate multiple cars quickly and easily. All I had to do was apply simple animation to this one null and the car would follow, automatically steering and bouncing in a realistic way. Believe it or not, the inspiration for this pull toy rig, as they tend to be called, came from Habib Zargapur's work on Star Wars Episode I, where he created this kind of rig for the pod racers. Other experiments just sit on my computer waiting for their moment in the sun. Here's one where I rigged up a flying car with automated control surfaces. Here's one where I created a tower gun that automatically aims and shoots at a randomly flying target. The tracer fire is made with Red Giant particular. One day my tinkering led me to revisit the look of some of my favorite video games from my youth. 3D vector graphics games like Star Wars and Battlezone. And it all started with a single expression in After Effects. This expression, or really this part of this expression, converts 3D coordinates to 2D coordinates. I use it all the time to place lens flares based on 3D nulls, like this. Here's a lens flare effect on a 2D solid. This is a simple 3D scene with a camera and some 3D layers. The center of the flare should match this 3D null. I can manually position it there, but what about when the camera starts moving? That's where my expression comes in. I'll twirl open the parameters for the flare, and option click the stopwatch to create an expression for the flare center. Now I pick whip the null, not its position, the actual layer itself. That generates the syntax for the name of the null layer. And after that, I type dot to comp. That's the magic that converts from 3D coordinates to 2D. But we need to give it a little more information. We want the center of the null, so we type 0, 0, 0 in square brackets in parentheses. And boom, the 2D position of the lens flare is locked to the screen space coordinates of the 3D null. It works when I move the camera, when I move the null, and even when the null goes off screen. So I had this crazy idea to link this expression to the After Effects beam effect, which I use all the time for drawing simple straight lines. Beam is a 2D effect, but what if I linked the start and end positions to 3D nulls using the 2Comp expression? And what if I kept adding nulls and beam effects until I had the appearance of a simple 3D object? In this way, I built a 2D render engine for 3D wireframe objects inside of After Effects using no third-party plugins. By drawing the lines one at a time in 2D space, I could do some fun tricks, like wiggling them and flickering them in a way that reminded me of those great vector graphics games. Here's the completed first test I made using this technique with some glow and scan lines from the hollow matrix effect in Red Giant Universe. It was around this time that I stumbled onto that photo of the tank again. 
As a teenager, I made this little maquette out of nothing more than graph paper and rubber cement. This little paper model was shouting its 3D coordinates at me from the past. So I built it next using my null and beam technique. That's when I realized that decades later, I was finally going to make my silly little short about a tank and that I would create this 3D animated film entirely in Adobe After Effects. Turns out I hadn't gotten it out of my system after all. Luckily, around this time, Seth Worley and his brother Ben were working on the Triune 80s Synth Pack, a collection of 80s-inspired stock music. There was one track that felt perfect for my short. I laid it into a comp in After Effects and started working on something I call a textomatic. I've done this before when planning music videos. It's basically just short lines of text synced with the music. The story beats I'd imagined as a kid were lining up perfectly with Ben's awesome track. So I moved on to the next step, which readers of the DV Rebels Guide will recognize as my signature barely legible storyboards. I drew them in note shelf on my iPad using my own templates. I then exported them to Dropbox and brought them into After Effects where I began replacing the text layers with the drawings. I used my Prolos Bordo preset to make it fast and easy to animate the boards. Bordo works by automatically animating across the duration of your layer according to start and end positions you set. There are settings for camera shake, camera ease, and even an automatic fade transition from one clip to the next. Working like this, I could quickly experiment with different timings without having to fuss with a bunch of keyframes. Now, I'm describing this process as a linear one, but in truth, I jumped around a lot. Some days I'd be up for the tedious task of modeling something complex like the car. Other days I'd be up for some elbows deep expression work, but eventually I completed the animatic and started animating actual shots. I did all the work in one gigantic After Effects project right on top of my animatic timeline. Each object in the film, the tank, the car, the speeder, has a master comp where it is built and animated. Remember that each individual vector line is a layer, with its start and end 3D coordinates hand-entered. The master tank comp has 446 layers. The master speeder comp has 546. In a shot with three speeders, the tank and the terrain, over 2,500 layers are being rendered just for the wireframes. The designs for the vehicles and characters had to be clean, simple, and original, but reminiscent of things we know and love. I drew them in Illustrator with Snap to Grid turned on, the modern version of my high school process of designing on graph paper. These grid lines enforced a certain design minimalism and geometric regularity, but they also served a very important role as I built the objects. Each end of each vector has two coordinates, each with an X, Y, and Z value. I would count squares in Illustrator and type in the correct numbers in After Effects. To make things slightly easier, I made checkboxes for edges that were symmetrical across the x-axis and another for mirroring the entire vector across x, so I only had to build one side of my models. In these early tests, you can see me trying out my models, rigs, and rendering methods. I experimented early on with using Trapcode Mirror to create the wireframe terrain, but ultimately decided that the environment should be more sparse to keep visual focus on the vehicles. Each rendered test taught me something and encouraged me to move forward. I was organically finding the look and feel of my film. Building models this way is ridiculously slow and painful, but strangely, that was an intentional part of my plan. A big part of the minimalistic look of digital art in games and even movies that we remember from the 80s comes from the practical limitations of the tools of the time. Vector video games had a maximum number of lines they could draw at any one time, and the modeling and animation in Tron, for example, was done with pure code just like Ed Catmull and Fred Park did in their groundbreaking 1972 animation of a human hand. I'm a big believer in the old adage that limitations inspire creativity. By embracing the cumbersome, painfully slow nature of my workflow, I was in a way trying to commune with my computer graphics forefathers. To this end, I began thinking of how my film might actually have been created in the 80s. Imagine you were somehow actually able to animate a film using the graphics engine of Atari Battlezone. How would you put it on film? The answer, of course, is that you'd film it off a monitor. But the 80s is also where I learned my love of cinemascope and anamorphic lenses. So I imagine that the clever, hand-coding-everything version of me making this movie in the 80s would figure out a way to get improved filmed resolution by splitting the frame in half. My imagined pipeline was that the left half would be filmed out first, literally by pointing a film camera at a 4x3 monitor, and then the film would be rewound, 
the camera panned over, and then the right half would be filmed, double exposed onto the same negative. So to create this look, I built this exact setup in After Effects. This meant modeling a very rough CRT display using After Effects layers. I used a curved layer for the screen, matching the unidirectional curve of a Sony Trinitron monitor. For the bezel, I added texture with photos of grime, and then worked out a complex system of casting the appropriate interactive light onto all the facets, all in 2D, using gradients and compound blurs. Even the screen gets a little dirt, which gets illuminated by the vectors. I then filmed this monitor with my virtual anamorphic camera. Vignetting and chromatic aberration came from Magic Bullet looks, and the overall celluloid look comes from Magic Bullet film. Some of my favorite aspects of the look of Tank come from being super nerdy about how I modeled this imagined analog filmmaking process. For example, I reasoned that the vector graphics would refresh at 60 hertz, so I did all my animation in 60 frame per second comps in After Effects. Then I simulated the way a camera would film that at 24 frames per second, which created some flicker and a subtle double image from moving lines that actually feels like motion blur, because in a way it is. This matched some reference photos I shot on a very important research trip to an arcade to play some actual Battlezone. I even imagined that despite our best analog efforts, maybe the left and right exposures might not be perfectly in sync. You can see this at certain cut points, including this one, which is probably my single favorite frame in the film. If you got all the way to the end of the film without noticing the TV screen gag, I made it abundantly obvious when both screens do a simultaneous shutoff. Rather than try to animate this complex analog effect, I just dusted off an old black and white broadcast CRT I had lying around and filmed it shutting off at 60 frames per second. Animating the car, tank, and speeders was made fairly easy thanks to the elaborate rigs I created for them. The speeder rig is based on that flying car test project. The central inspiration I had for this rig was to use an After Effects camera with its implicit point of interest constraint to model the motion of a craft moving through a fluid like air. I used an expression to link the point of interest to the camera position, but offset in Z and delayed in time. When the camera moves up, the point of interest moves up a moment later. This delay automatically creates a kind of bobbing animation where position and rotation are related, giving a sense of mass and follow through. Other expressions link roll rotation to this motion, so the craft seems to pitch into its turns. The same idea allows the flaps to appear to predict the motion of the craft. The final step is to add a little random noise to the position to simulate turbulence. All the other linked controls follow along, and now you have an infinite supply of lively organic aircraft animation. One important aspect of the look of tank is the dimming of the vectors on the back sides of objects. In some cases I was able to handle this automatically, using a variation on the old expression trick of linking a 3D layer's opacity to its angle facing the camera. I have a free preset that does this called Front Back Visibility, which is a part of the ProLost EDC presets. But for the shots that this didn't work on, I had to animate the dim state of the vectors by hand. This shot of the pilot turning his head took me a full day to dim and undim. As I worked my way through animating each shot, I'd often run into special cases that required unique solutions. For the explosions and effects, I created special expressions that would drive my layers with simulated physics. These expressions came from the mighty Dan Eberts in what has to be one of the all-time greatest After Effects expressions tutorials ever, building your own 3D particle generator on Creative Cow. I used these particles everywhere, from explosions, to sparks, to debris from the crashing speeder. The laser beams were a special version of this particle system. They actually fire in a ballistic way and can die when they impact with the surface or the ground. When the tank opens fire, I worked out a variation of this laser system that would aim at a 3D null. Each laser beam would randomly choose which gun to fire from and which target null to aim for. When we cut in close to those gun turrets on the tank, the rigging is based on that gun tower test I did with Particular years ago. For the shot where the tank pushes through the smoke, I worked out a method of pushing circles away from the center of a virtual sphere. Then I merged three of these rigs into one, using the three spheres to represent the masses of the tank. For the mushroom cloud, I created a parameterized particle system that allowed me to sculpt the mushroom shape with a motion path. The disc-shaped particles are born and die along this path, and their rotation is based on their angle from the center. For the tank explosion, there are several effects working together. There's a particle explosion, a 2D circular shockwave inspired by the Star Wars arcade game, and a 3D displacement that ripples out from the center of the explosion. Just before the tank explodes, 
a wave of grid-like particles spreads across its surface. For this effect, I created a special particle system that would flake off these tiny lines from the faces of the tank. This grid-based particle system was also useful for the explosion impacts on the ground and the impact of the crashing speeder. Since each laser blast or particle or bit of exploding debris is an individual layer, I needed an expedient system of duplicating and nudging layers. I wound up creating a custom control surface on my iPad using an amazing app called Quadro. Each button can launch multiple keyboard shortcuts, so for example this one duplicates the current layer and scoots the duplicate forward 10 frames. Press it a few times and you've got laser fire. I got to the point where I couldn't work on tank without my iPad in front of me. Maybe the most complex rig I created was for the pilot. This too began as an ill-advised experiment of inverse kinematic rigging in After Effects. I realized that building a fully rigged human model in After Effects is not something a sane person would attempt, but here we are. For the animation of the pilot stepping out of the speeder wreck, I shot reference footage of myself and then rotomated on top of that. Building the rig took weeks, but the animation only took a day. Maybe we're starting to learn why I never quite finished any of my animated film projects before. As my shots came together, I started to realize that they played a lot differently on the screen than my storyboards had. It takes your eyes some time to process these wireframe images, and my animatic cut was a little too fast in some places. So I recut things a few times, which then meant going back and reshuffling things in the animation. The final film can all be rendered at once from this one massive 265 megabyte After Effects project file. At about a minute per frame, that would take two and a half days. To help me manage this, I relied on BG Renderer Pro from AE Scripts, so I could keep working while I was rendering and receive notifications when my renders were complete. Toward the end of the process, I would also output a thumbnail collage with each render so I could check color and brightness consistency across all the shots. This was easy to set up with the Make Thumbnails Comp script that I include with the DV Rebel Tools, a free set of presets that you can find a link to at the end of this video. Sound design was something I approached with some trepidation. For almost a year I had lived with the film as a music video, with no sound effects. I was afraid that once I started adding a few sounds here and there, I'd wind up having to go all the way with it, and that's exactly what happened. Not counting my high school efforts, I started work on Tank in January of 2017. A month later, I knew it was something I was going to pursue. Some weeks I worked on little else. Sometimes a month or more would go by without me having the time to touch it. Starting things is fun, but finishing them is hard, and I was starting to feel like Tank would never end. But then I stumbled on this article about an animator who hand drew every frame of his film over the course of four years, and I thought, I may be crazy, but at least I'm not alone. In fact, if any of this seems like something you'd want to try, I've packaged up my basic setup into a free After Effects project. I call it Vector Kit, and you can download it with a link at the end of this video. In the project is a tutorial that walks you through the basic process of creating a simple cube. There's also a sample logo and a simple animation of, you guessed it, a tank, but this one's from Battlezone, the video game that inspired so much of the look and the feel of my film. When you open up the project, jump to the tutorial comp and just step through the frames, following the instructions as you go. At the end of the process, you'll have a 3D vector graphics cube and an absolute certainty that I have lost my mind. No one would have ever advised me to spend a year and a half of my life making a retro sci-fi short film with no dialogue. But I didn't do it because it was a good idea. I did it because this film has been trying to find its way out of me ever since I was a kid. I made Tank to reconnect with that part of me that just can't help but make things and try to organize them into stories. I get so wrapped up in the accessibility of filmmaking that it was nice to just let something be hard in a way that was as therapeutic as it was maddening. In the end, I may have been crazy to make a film this way, but I feel a little bit less crazy for having done it.